Okay. Hello, hi everyone. Welcome to the Geoscience and Geoenergy webinar of today, 2nd of December 2021. Uh, we will have two more webinars this, uh, this year. Uh, the next one, the next week and the week after, and then we are going to have the end of the year break. Um, today, Sebastian and myself are uh, delighted and honored to host our dear colleague, uh, Andre Niemeyer from uh, Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Uh, Andre is associate professor at Utrecht University. He obtained his PhD in geology uh, from the same university, Utrecht University. After that, he became postdoc researcher at Penn State University, Pennsylvania Department of Geosciences. Then also, he became also postdoc after that, uh, postdoctoral research flow at the National Institute of Geophysics and Volcanology in Rome, in Italy. He then moved back to uh, the Netherlands, Utrecht University, where he was originally going from to discover uh, other horizons. Back in the Netherlands, home first as postdoc research fellow, and then assistant, and finally, since 2020, uh, last year as associate professor. He leads several research topics related to geomechanics, including fault friction and induced seismicity, among many others. Among his many research grants, he has been also among the Dutch National Science Foundation uh, talent scheme grants of Veni and VD, also ERC starting. I uh, envy him. He has got uh, literally every every grant he has applied to. So he's a, a, a very good a neighbor in Utrecht and we are in Delft. So I, we look at him and see what, what he is doing the next. And so, so it's great uh, pleasure for us, Andre, to have you here. And please, for to the audience, uh, for more information and knowledge about his activities and his group activities, uh, please do visit his scholar page. We are going to send the link also in the chat box, so you visit and get in touch with him uh, for mutual collaboration or or if you have further uh, questions from him. Uh, and uh, to the audience, please note that lecture would last for about uh, 30, 35 minutes, and then, like always, it will be followed up by discussion, questions, and uh, answering. Please do not wait until the end of Andre's uh, lecture to post your questions whenever you feel appropriate. Do type your questions in the chat box. Your question will motivate other colleagues to also participate and engage and ask questions. Uh, without any uh, further ado, uh, Andre, we are all looking forward to hearing your lecture and thank you once more for accepting our invitation. Uh, great. Thank you, uh, Hadi, for this very nice uh, introduction. Um, as Hadi mentioned, uh, I did my uh, PhD and also my master's uh, research at Utrecht University. And uh, most of my work uh, takes place uh, in the laboratory, as you can see from my uh, first slide. But um, the main focus is uh, to understand uh, rock behavior from what happens on this uh, really micro scale uh, of uh, fault rocks and rocks uh, in general, and in particular, how fluids affect uh, their behavior. And I am mostly focused on fault friction, so I work on uh, natural and induced uh, seismicity. Of course, uh, that's been a hot topic in the Netherlands. So let me uh, go to the outline of my talk. Um, first, I will talk about these earthquakes in the Netherlands, for those of you who have never heard of them. Then I will talk a little bit about uh, how uh, fault friction is important in uh, earthquake research. And then I'll provide a few examples. Um, one example on, uh, or with an application to induced seismicity, and one example of uh, mineral reactions that, that affect uh, fault strength, which has a more of an application to natural faults or natural earthquakes. And then I will continue with um, our microphysical interpretation of how uh, fault friction varies in under the influence of fluid uh, assisted deformation mechanisms and hopefully i'll have time to show you some uh, results from the implementation of this really microphysics based model uh, into a seismic cycle simulator and what effects it has on uh, the seismic cycle in a natural uh, setting and i'll end up with some conclusions so uh, induced seismicity in the Netherlands uh, has been a hot topic uh, since the earthquake in 2012. Um, a magnitude 3.6 earthquakes happened, happened in uh, Huizingen. Uh, 
And the problem here is that we have been extracting gas since the early uh, 60s, which led to uh, reservoir compaction, which leads to uh, stress changes. And that has uh, resulted in the reactivation of uh, pre-existing faults in uh, microseismic events. And that's um, for your uh, reference. The square here is the Groninger gas field. It was once one of the largest uh, gas fields um, on shore. And on the right here are all the earthquakes that have been registered um, since uh, the early 90s. So up to uh, 3.6 right here. Now these are pretty small earthquakes. So in Japan, uh, you probably wouldn't worry about these too much, but this is uh, happening at a very shallow level, only three kilometers. And our uh, subsurface uh, above those three kilometers, especially the soils, they're very uh, sloppy. So you get a lot of shaking uh, at the surface, surface, which leads to damage. Um, furthermore, it's human induced. So it is not uh, something that uh, people are very happy about. Now, uh, these earthquakes have been uh, relocated. And as you can see from this map, they seem to occur on uh, faults within the reservoir, so pre-existing faults. Now, that's very uh, logical because there are quite a lot of faults uh, in the reservoir. So there are over a thousand faults that have been mapped. And if we go to uh, exposures of um, similar rock types where faults uh, are present as well, then we can see that, um, so here's an example from uh, Scotland, as you can see, beautiful blue skies. Um, there's the sandstone and another sandstone. It's actually the same sandstone. You can see that this uh, fold here, um, a very small fold really, it's only 20 meters of offset or so, but you can see in the core of that fold, there is this very fine grained material, which is produced when uh, these rocks are sliding past each other. And it's this, this fine uh, powdered material that is controlling how uh, the folds slip. So if you want to understand how earthquakes uh, nucleate and propagate, we have to understand how this material uh, behaves under the in situ uh, conditions. So the friction of this material is key. Now, what is friction? Uh, it's basically the shear force that you need to uh, push this block uh, with a normal weight on it and divide it by that uh, normal weight. And uh, what is important here is that if you uh, take this uh, area then uh, the, to calculate your normal stress, then that area is not uh, totally supporting the normal force at all. In, in fact, every surface in nature is rough. It has a certain roughness. So that means that the contact area between the two blocks is not the same as the total area of the blocks. Now this uh, was recognized quite early and this has led to um, the development of this set of equations, uh, which is called the rate and state friction equations. And what um, it tells you is that if you're sliding this block at a constant velocity, you will have a constant friction, assuming that temperature, pressure, all the other things remain constant. Now, if we want to move this block faster, then first we will have to overcome uh, a peak in strength. And then the friction will evolve to a new steady state value that belongs to this new velocity at which we are sliding. The reason that that friction at a different velocity is different is because the contact area between the two blocks is uh, time dependent. Now, if this change in friction is uh, negative, meaning that uh, friction becomes smaller as we go faster, then you can imagine then it becomes easy to accelerate the block. However, if it becomes uh, larger, then uh, it becomes more difficult to accelerate the block and you would not get an instability. So this is a very um, crucial set of equations. It's been very popular in uh, models. And how do we uh, use this in, in the modeling of, of uh, the seismic cycle? Well, you can think of it uh, of uh, earthquake faults as an, an in terms of this analog model, uh, which is a spring block analog. And what it is, it's a block that is attached to a spring, which is pulled at a constant velocity. As we're pulling this spring, we are increasing the shear force on this uh, interface. And at some point that force will be larger than the strength of the interface and the block will slide. And as the block slides, the spring contracts 
and uh, we release some energy and the block will um, decelerate again. And of course, we can visualize this quite nicely. You can see that it moves in uh, a jerky fashion and we can uh, calculate how fast and how far this block moves if we know everything about the interface of uh, the two blocks. So the amount of slip that occurs in uh, each event is controlled by how fast we're pulling the spring, by how stiff our spring is, by how much uh, force is on uh, the interface, but importantly, also by the frictional properties of this contact. And we can see this in this movie where we have a marble, marble block which is much smoother, which has a lower friction, you can see that the events are much smaller in this case. So the frictional properties are controlling the size of our uh, small scale earthquakes. So what we can do in the laboratory, we can take uh, fault rocks and we can determine their frictional strength and their velocity dependence. And that will tell us something about how prone they are to uh, nucleating earthquakes and what size of earthquakes. How do we do that? Um, we can do that by uh, modeling a fault as a series of spring sliders. So this is a snapshot of uh, one of these open source uh, codes that we have actually used. It's called QDIN. It's a quasi-dynamic uh, seismic simulator. On each uh, node in this uh, fault surface, we specify the rate of state frictional properties, and then we apply a boundary uh, condition, namely some kind of loading velocity. And as the fault is being loaded, some points on the fault will slip and depending on the frictional properties and the elasticity and the forces, the normal forces on that element, it will slide uh, at a different velocity. So the color bar here uh, indicates the velocity. So we see this very dark blue color is a locked zone. Um, the lighter colors are actually slipping slightly faster. And you can do this and then simulate multiple uh, seismic cycles. So what you see here is an example where um, the authors have tried to simulate a Tohoku type earthquake where you see this patch, um, lock patch is starting to slip. And at some point, uh, the slip accelerates and it propagates on and covers the entire uh, fault surface. You can also see these smaller earthquakes that are popping up uh, here as well. Now, this model is set up by uh, inputting uh, variable uh, values of a and uh, or a minus b, so this velocity dependence or friction. But this is really an empirical um, parameter which is being determined by laboratory experiments. Of course, laboratory experiments are always on a smaller scale and at a different time scale. So, how do we make sure that what we put into this model is actually realistic for natural settings? And for that, we need to have a microphysical basis. So this is what we do in the high pressure and temperature lab. We do laboratory experiments where we uh, simulate natural fault rocks and we try to activate deformation mechanisms that have been identified in natural uh, examples. After the experiment, we verify that the microstructure we produced is comparable to what we see in nature. We try to um, identify the deformation mechanisms, quantify its kinetics, and then link that to a microscale model. And that microscale model can then be used to uh, predict our uh, laboratory results, actually validate the model. And then we can use the kinetics of the process to uh, bridge the scales to nature, where we can uh, simulate longer time scale processes. So this is kind of a loop where we can uh, use the larger scale models to compare with natural observations, the natural observations we compare with our small scale laboratory experiments, and they all feed into this micro scale model. So, the key, uh, the central point here is the micro physical uh, understanding. So, in the following uh, slides, I will talk about some friction experiments that uh, are aimed at uh, induced seismicity, and then I will continue with some hydrothermal. Uh, friction experiments focusing on the effects of uh, mineral reactions and how that affects friction. So how do we do these uh, friction experiments? Uh, in these uh, experiments we've used a direct shear approach uh, where we have two let me put on the pointer where we have two L-shaped uh, pistons which have a roughened uh, interface. On that interface we uh, deposit our 
uh, crushed up uh, fault rock material, which is simulating this fine-grained uh, wear product that is coating uh, natural faults. Then we uh, close the sandwich, creating the cylinder. The cylinder is then being jacketed by a rubber uh, EPDM jacket. The holes um, are filled with uh, silly putty, which is a very uh, soft material that can easily be squeezed out. And then we uh, load this uh, cylindrical assembly inside our triaxial pressure vessel, which is shown in this picture. In this pressure vessel, there is a silicon oil that can pressurize uh, the cylinder that um, generates a normal stress on our gouge layer. And then we can squeeze um, our cylinder together, which uh, extrudes the silly putty and it creates displacement on our interface here. And we can do this under the in situ uh, Groningen uh, conditions of pressure, temperature, as well as chemistry of the fluids. So this is what uh, we, uh, or I say we, but my PhD student um, now graduated uh, did. He took uh, the different samples from the Groningen lithology. So we have our Slochtere sandstone, which is the reservoir rocks. Um, it's overlain by this Tenboer claystone and a basal zechstein. And there's a carboniferous shale underneath. The faults that cross-cut this reservoir, they sometimes um, juxtapose these uh, lithologies across from each other. So it's important to understand the frictional behavior of all the lithologies that, are, that might be involved along this fault um, in the Groningen reservoirs. So the question is how strong are these faults and what is their uh, velocity dependence of friction? So if you do these experiments, the typical data that we obtain are uh, like this. Here is the friction coefficient, which is simply the shear stress divided by the applied effective normal stress. Conditions here, temperature is 100 degrees, which is roughly the temperature at three kilometers depth. The confining pressure is 55 MPa, meaning that uh, the total normal stress on the layer is 55 MPa as well. And then we have a pore fluid pressure of 15 MPa. In this case, it is with deionized water. What you see is we have a run-in at a certain uh, low point velocity, in this case 5.4 5 micron, 5 micron per second. And then we instantaneously change the, light, the sliding velocity to obtain this um, velocity dependence of friction. So we take these empirical equations and we fit um, uh, the equations to our data and we get um, the individual parameters. So in this case, it gives you a positive value of A minus B. The four different colors show the four different lithologies. So we have the uh, very weak Tenboer claystone, which is mostly uh, clays plus um, some, oh, this level is wrong. Um, we have the Carboniferous shale, which is also uh, clay rich, slightly stronger. We have our Slochtere sandstone, which is even richer in quartz. And then we have um, our basal zechstein, which is composed of um, evaporites, so it's anhydrides, um, some calcite and dolomite. And it's even stronger still. And what it shows is that there's considerable heterogeneity uh, in the uh, frictional strength of these materials. We can summarize this uh, like this. We have our Groningen stratigraphy. Then we have our coefficient of sliding friction. Our basal zechstein is strongest. Then we have mixtures of the two. Um, basal zechstein plus the tambour. Basal zechstein plus the Slochtere sandstone. The tambour claystone the Tambour and Slochter sandstone, etc., And you can see that there's quite a uh, considerable variation in strength um, as you go through uh, this stratigraphy. This, of course, has a huge effect on how uh, earthquakes, once they've been nucleated, uh, how they would propagate. Um, now, interestingly, the rate dependence of friction in most cases is uh, positive, which would mean that in the framework of this rate and state friction equations, which I talked about, we sh shouldn't be able to nucleate an earthquake. Now, of course, the rate and state friction equations is um, a very uh, interesting set of equations, but it doesn't take into account that um, the stress changes that we impose on our Groningen faults are much faster than what you would see in uh, natural uh, loading conditions. So we might want to look at different type of friction laws. So one of the uh, other types of friction laws that's typically used is that you have a failure at some peak stress and then a linear uh, slip weakening. Now, 
the faults in the Groningen Reservoir haven't been active for a very long time. So during that uh, time where they were not active, there have been all these um, mechanisms that can operate to strengthen this fault. The gouge layer can become uh, cemented, and that would cause quite a significant change in this peak strength, which is not covered in our uh, sliding experiments. So in order to investigate this, uh, we did slide hold slide experiments, uh, which are done something like this. So you have the same type of curves, coefficient of friction as a function of shear displacement. But now um, when we're sliding, we uh, stop sliding for a predetermined amount of time. So in this case, we go in half order of magnitude uh, durations going from 10 all the way up to 60,000 uh, second holds. And then we restart the sliding at the same sliding velocity. And what you can see, um, first of all, we see the same contrast in uh, coefficient of friction as in the previous experiment. But we also see a very different uh, re-sliding behavior. So we have the clay-rich uh, lithologies they are down here, and they show almost no change after a whole period. Whereas the uh, orange and blue uh, curves, they show this distinct peak upon re-sliding. And that peak is the re-strengthening that occurs when the fault is being inactive. Now, we also did some experiments at a really long time scale. And so these are the longest uh, hold, uh, holds that have ever been done, up to uh, three months even. And we can see that this strengthening actually continues. And we can quantify this uh, change in coefficient of friction and then plot them as a function of uh, the hold time. And that's what's shown here. Here's the hold duration. Now, uh, unlucky, and the orange is the, the clay-rich rock. You can see that pretty much the re-strengthening is zero, whereas the sandstone and uh, the basal zechstein show this very pronounced re-strengthening up to a friction uh, increase of 0.16. Um, and this doesn't seem to stop. So how do we actually ex extrapolate this to the millions of years uh, that the Groningen faults were not active? I will get to back to that later. Another interesting observation is that uh, in some of the really long hold uh, experiments, we saw upon the re-slide that the re-slide was unstable. And we saw a big stress drop up to 7 MPa uh, with a very rapid slip uh, with centimeters uh, per second. So that suggests that these materials, even though they are velocity strengthening, because of this strength increase that occurs um, maybe due to uh, cementation, you can get um, a seismic event uh, upon reloading them. Now, what is actually happening in these samples? Um, we think that in uh, especially the Sechstein uh, samples, we observe this indentation of uh, grains where grains are dissolving into another grain and material is precipitating outside of this contact. And we think that this causes some cohesion to be developed uh, during uh, the period of inactivity. And upon resliding, this cohesion has to be destroyed again. And that causes this stress drop um, after um, reactivation of our fault. So, so far, um, the induced seismicity application, I'm going to switch gears completely now. And I'm going to talk about some experiments that were done in our very unique uh, hydrothermal rotary shear apparatus. Um, in this case, the pressure vessel is filled with water and the water is able to penetrate the sample. Um, in this uh, apparatus, we can reach temperatures up to 700 degrees C and we can uh, impose displacement rates varying between nanometers per second, which is close to the rate of, uh, at which plates move, uh, up to several millimeters uh, per second. And because it's a rotary shear, we can keep going um, in theory, uh, for infinite displacements. So we're not limited to this five millimeter displacement uh, like in the direct shear. So what does the uh, sample assembly look like? Um, it's this uh, Rene nickel alloy uh, material, which is ring shaped with an outer diameter of 28 millimeter and inside diameter of 22 millimeter. The uh, gouge layer is deposited on this roughed uh, surface. We use a loose powder as a simulated fold gouge. We have rings that confine that powder and we 
uh, close the assembly and we rotate one side when we keep the other side uh, stationary. And then that's uh, surrounded by a furnace which can go up to uh, 700 degrees C. Now I'm going to jump straight to some results. Um, so in this apparatus, I performed uh, experiments on mixtures of dolomite and quartz. So these are basically simulated fold gouges at 120 MPa, effective normal stress, at uh, different temperatures up to 500 degrees. And um, the sliding velocity was something like 10 nanometers per second. And what you can see is that at room temperature, this mixture is quite strong. Uh, dolomite and quartz are friction frictionally strong uh, minerals. But as we increase temperature, we see a pronounced uh, decrease in friction down to a uh, friction of about 0.3 at 400 degrees. And in fact, this uh, low friction or the friction at 400 degrees depends on how long uh, we slide. So after this, uh, what is it? three days of sliding, we have this very low friction, whereas if we go uh, only five hours, we, our friction is um, much higher. So we infer that from this um, data, it suggests that we have this uh, mineral reaction that is going on in our experiments. We have dolomite that is reacting with quartz and water, and it's forming this weak, uh, frictionally weak mineral called talc, plus some calcite as well as CO2. So let's look at the microstructure. Um, can we actually find some talc? So this is a microstructure of the sample that was sheared at 300 degrees C. These are uh, the teeth that are in our uh, pistons. So you can see that this is still uh, recovered. Whereas on the other side, we don't uh, see this teeth. And instead we see, uh, well, we don't see anything because we don't see any grains in there. So the bulk of the sample has these uh, quite large dolomite grains. Uh, I see that there's no skill bar, that's really terrible. Um, but the entire thickness here is about 800 micron. Uh, so we have this very uh, narrow zone where the grains uh, cannot be recognized anymore, suggesting that they are uh, very fine grained indeed below the wavelength or light. Now, if we do a chemical analysis on uh, this material, luckily we do have a skill bar in here. Here's our fine grained zone. And what I've done here is I've um, plotted the uh, different uh, elements in different colors. So we have our uh, calcium in red, magnesium in uh, green, and our silicon in uh, blue. So if you would have quartz, it would show up as blue. And you can see clearly see those blue grains, but we also see some calcite grains in the matrix here. But very importantly, uh, in this boundary shear, we see almost no more dolomite and we see lots of uh, cyan colored grains and calcite grains as well. So this suggests that we do have uh, talc that's being formed, but it's only forming on this uh, boundary shear. We can see this more clearly if we only look at uh, silica. So this is a 16 color uh, lookup table. Um, the quartz grains show up as very bright spots. And in between, you can see that wherever you have silica, it must be uh, a silicate phase, so not dolomite and not calcite. You can see clearly that it is present in this boundary shear, but also in between the dolomite grains, and go back to this one, along the grain contacts, you can see, like here, you can see that talc is being formed. Now, uh, this is the sample that was deformed at 400 degrees as well as 300 degrees. And this is quite a spectacular uh, microstructure, if I say so myself. And you can see clearly that there is calcite being formed. You can see that it's forming very localized in this uh, shear band as well as in a matrix. There's still quartz uh, that is left over. There is a lot on this side. Um, there's no quartz on this side, but there is a lot of calcite and a lot of talc. And we can see that also in the silica, uh, silicon map, this is uh, clearly, we see lots of talc that is being formed. And you can imagine if we are trying to uh, shear this uh, sample, then there should be enough uh, low friction talc present to allow us to accommodate deformation at very low uh, shear stress indeed. So this shows that these mineral reactions have a profound effect on long-term uh, fault strength. Now, is this relevant to nature? Well, yes, it is. Um, 
This is an example from uh, the Zucali fault, which is an uh, inactive uh, exposed uh, low angle normal fault. It is exposed on the Isle of Elba, and where we can see that um, the host rock is mostly dolomite and uh, it has some calcite. And as we go from the host rock into our uh, fault zone, which has accommodated kilometers of displacement, we can see that we start to see this foliation and we start to see um, in the XRD more and more uh, talc appearing. So the talc is allowing this fault to slide under a low shear stress. So without the formation of this talc, uh, this would not be possible. Interestingly, in the experiments, I glanced over this, we also see that at 500 degrees, friction recovers again. So we see a strengthening uh, as, in, as we increase temperature. So what is the reason for this? Well, that is because at 500 degrees, we are no longer producing talc. Here's an XRD uh, spectrum. In red is our starting material, which is quartz and dolomite. Uh, so the different mineral phases uh, are shown with these triangles, upside down triangles. And if you would have talc, then we would expect a pronounced peak here, which is not uh, present. Instead, we see peaks in the blue um, that are related to diopsides. So those are the black triangles. Um, as well as uh, tremolite, which are the orange triangles. So clearly, uh, we are producing different minerals that are causing uh, different fault strengths. So this would suggest that the Zucali fault would not um, be weak any longer at higher temperatures. Now, to uh, shift gears yet again, uh, how do we um, take into account these uh, fluid rock interactions? So, a long time ago, uh, we did experiments on uh, rock analog materials because a lot of the uh, mineral reactions, uh, you need quite uh, high temperatures and long duration experiments to be able to study their effects. So it's nice to have materials that um, you can use as an analog so that we can do experiments at a reasonable time scale and preferably at room temperature as well. So we do experiments on uh, halite, uh, rock salt, which is an analog for quartz um, because it dissolves and precipitates really fast at room temperature. So we can study this process under um, easily accessible uh, laboratory conditions. So what's shown here is a bunch of different studies that have measured the steady state friction as a function of different low point velocities, basically crossing the entire range of velocities that you would expect in a natural fault. And you can see that there is in fact a velocity strengthening regime, a velocity weakening regime, and then another velocity strengthening regime, and then a dynamic weakening. Does this happen in um, the real materials as well? This is quartz muscovite at 500 degrees. Um, the slowest experiment here is 30 nanometers per second. You can see that this really pronounced weakening. Uh, this experiment lasted 10 days. You can imagine that we don't want to do too many of these experiments. So looking at the profile, uh, I have to speed up a little bit, I see. Um, you can see this pronounced velocity strengthening that uh, moves over to a velocity weakening, and I didn't reach this velocity strengthening regime. Now, this was already recognized by uh, Toshi Shimamoto in the 80s, where there's, he suggested that we have a flow regime, a transitional regime, a frictional regime, and then a high-speed regime. And we see this in the microstructure as well. In this, uh, foliated uh, salt clay mixture, it looks almost like a natural myelinite. So it's really flowing, but it is actually a combination of a frictional process sliding over the foliation with accommodation of uh, the intervening class by dissolution and precipitation, uh, dissolution, diffusion and precipitation. If you go to the intermediate regime, we see this uh, chaotic microstructure where we start generating porosity and that uh, continues um, until we uh, create or reach this some kind of critical state velocity. Now we've over the years developed a model which we dubbed the Chen Niemeyer Spires model or CNS model. And it's basically um, centered around the assumption that the velocity of our gouts layer controls strength. And that is through the angle of this contact. As the velocity goes down, the angle uh, goes up. So that means that the strength has to go up. The second uh, concept is that as we um, 
are sharing this layer, we have two competing processes. We have a slip-dependent dilatation, which tends to increase porosity, and we have a time-dependent compaction, which tends to decrease porosity. Those two will balance out at constant velocity, creating a constant steady-state porosity. But as we go faster, we have less of the time-dependent deformation, so we get a higher porosity and a lower strength. Now, I won't go into detail, but you can couple um, these equations based on this microstructure. And then you can use the boundary conditions and the geometry of the microstructure to predict what the frictional strength of your gouge layer is based on the competition between this time-dependent mechanism and the slip-dependent mechanism. And all we need to put in is the kinetics of uh, dissolution, diffusion, and precipitation. And that predicts a profile that looks like this. We have a low velocity regime where the strength decreases quite rapidly because it's flowing. It's deforming by uh, diffusion creep, if you will. As we increase velocity, we reach some peak strength. We then have a velocity weakening regime. And then we go to a critical state porosity. And we have a velocity strengthening regime. Can we reproduce our laboratory data? Yes, we can. We can actually um, use this model to uh, simulate our uh, velocity stepping scheme. In red here is some calcite data from Chen. And he simulated this uh, experiment. And you can see we see an increase in uh, friction and then an evolution to a new steady state. If we change um, <coughs> the step, we get a different response. We can also simulate the healing that occurs during uh, these slide or slide experiments. So that is what is shown here. And that fits really quite nicely. So having a bit of confidence that they can reproduce our uh, experiments, we've uh, implemented this into uh, this quasi-dynamic uh, seismic cycle simulator. And in here, we've taken uh, field observations where um, outcrops of exhumed uh, subduction uh, zone uh, material uh, suggests that there is this uh, melange of uh, materials that um, are frictionally strong, uh, basically what is known as asperities, that are surrounded by materials that are um, more flowing. So we have a compositional heterogeneity, which we can translate to a rheological heterogeneity. So in our model, we input um, these asperities according to a power law distribution. So we have um, two different materials, a gouge material, which is frictionally unstable at our loading rate. And we have our creeping material, which is frictionally uh, stable at uh, the loading rate. And the only difference between these two is the kinetics of the pressure solution. So the filonite, the stable material is going has faster pressure solution kinetics than the gouge material. And that's the only difference between the two. We distribute this material along our uh, fault, which is uh, simulated at 300 uh, degrees C, so at a certain uh, depth level. And then we run the model and we can uh, see what the slip velocity is in the different parts of the fault. Our first test is with uh, two asperities. So we have one big asperity here and a small asperity there. We already see interesting behavior. So the color scale denotes the slip velocity that is being attained along this fault uh, surface. This is the long strike position. We have events that occur in our, asper our asperities. They're called P instability as for partial. But occasionally we have faults that rupture the entire or, sorry, we have events that rupture the entire fault. So they go through this material that in between um, these events is stably uh, creeping along. So this already indicates some interesting behavior. We can make it more complicated. So now we have our full um, fault distributed with different size asperities, um, where we have the different uh, fractal dimensions of the power law distribution of asperities. And we can see completely different behavior. Here we have lots of uh, smaller events and then occasional uh, total events. Whereas in this case, we have a fault that is, sorry, whereas in this case, I have to point in the right thing, uh, we have a fault that is um, pretty much quiet all along its uh, strike, except for these total instabilities that occur um, after a significant amount of time. So that is really depending on the distribution of these asperities um, 
how <coughs> how many uh, big versus uh, small uh, asperities are present. So this is really quite a nice analog for great or mega earthquakes in nature. And it also tells us that we can uh, not really take a seismicity record of the last uh, 100 years and say that uh, a fault where no earthquakes have occurred is going to be safe forever. So how does this really work? If we have our um, creeping material that is uh, velocity strengthening, it is uh, sliding along at uh, the plate um, boundary rate, but in between uh, the asperities that surround this creeping material are going off in small earthquakes or accelerating, and that is increasing the stress on um, the stable parts of the fault. And that leads to a slightly elevated strain rate. And at some point, uh, we go over this peak in strength and we reach the velocity weakening regime, and then they will uh, nucleate uh, an earthquake as well. So this is a microphysical uh, interpretation of our uh, seismic cycle uh, simulation. So I think it's time for me to uh, round off. Um, I think, I hope I've shown you that these thermally activated time, de time dependent mechanisms and that are active on the grain scale can significant, significantly change the macroscopic uh, fault strength. Um, I've shown you that mineral reactions can occur on a time scale of days in the laboratory, at least in experiments where we impose differential stress, and they can have a large effect on fault strength. We need to understand the deformation mechanisms that are um, operating in, in natural uh, fault rocks as well as in our experiments to be able to reproduce, um, in, to extrapolate our experimental results to um, natural time and space, spatial skills. If you have these models, then we have a more reliable basis to use things like seismic cycle simulators and forecast things like seismicity distributions. Now, of course, our model is a simplification of reality. We have not included every single deformation mechanism. Uh, we are currently assuming a constant microstructure uh, that is steady state. So that's not very realistic because it's uh, probably uh, evolving. So we need to include things like grain size reduction as well as how much localization of slip is occurring. But um, we have been um, steadily in, uh, including more and more uh, aspects. So one of the things that I just wanted to mention is that we have added um, the development of cohesion where you have the precipitation of materials at the edges of this contact. And now we are um, in the process of doing further testing to see whether we have correctly formulated this and how fast this process really operates in uh, natural fault rocks. So this uh, could be quite important for the faults that are present in Groningen, where, which have been inactive for such a long time that they must have had some uh, cohesion development. And with that, uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you a lot, Andre, for this fascinating talk. Uh, I see plenty of questions posted, and so without taking any moment, uh, I'd like to give the floor to Sebastian to pick them up. Do you want yes, me to indeed. stop sharing? Yeah. Uh, yes, please, kindly. So, and then see if you can see us. Do, can you see us? Yes. Excellent. So, please. Thank you very much also from my side, Andre, for really fascinating and great talk. And as Hardy said, plenty, plenty, plenty of questions coming in. So I'm going to try to organize them a little bit. I start with uh, Margie Bone. So first of all, thank you for the very nice presentation. And she asks, right. related to strengthening experiments, can we assume if we stop production from honing and after a while the falls will gain strength and it will be safe to reproduce after some time? That's a, that's a really nice question. Um, I, I think that the processes that we're looking at um, are quite a long time scale. But yes, indeed, our experiments suggest that even after three months, you already get quite a significant strength increase. Uh, but th there's one aspect that I didn't uh, talk about, and that is the stress distribution along the faults. So um, the fact that the faults regain strength is great, but we don't really know um, whether this occurs along the entire fault. So parts that are much richer in clays, uh, they will regain less strength. So those could still be locations where an earthquake could um, nucleate, uh, 
And as soon as you have a, the, the nucleation of a rupture, then you have a stress drop and that could uh, help you to overcome the false strength that you have regained in the previous 20 years, let's say. So I wouldn't say that it's, it, it would be perfectly safe again. I think we still don't know enough of the subsurface in Groningen to really uh, answer this question. Because the other thing that is really important is, yeah, what are the normal and shear stresses on the different faults? Okay. Thank you. I'm just going to sneak in a quick question from my side. So you showed that the different pathologies in honing and they have different behaviors. So what actually happens exactly at the interfaces? If you have sort of two very different slip behaviors. That's a very good question. Um, so there's two, two answers I can give to this. First of all, if you have the juxtaposition of different lithologies, there's going to be some mixing of material. Um, maybe the clay rich materials are easier to get smeared into the folds. That would be a good thing, right? Because those, those are quite weak, um, but don't show a stress drop. So they don't really have a lot of uh, energy to provide for ruptures. Um, but we don't really know too much about this whole mixing uh, mechanism. So we don't really know the composition of all the faults uh, in the Groningen Reservoir. The other thing is that if a rupture starts somewhere, and then it goes into a segment of the fault where the strength is different, then it will depend on uh, how much energy the rupture has, whether it can overcome the strength of the fault there, right? So this requires, yeah, basically models to be able to um, answer that question. I think uh, in most cases, the ruptures don't really propagate into um, the below in the un underburden. Um, but that also has to do with the stress state. Mm. So again, it's a stress and frictional strength, fault strength uh, combination. We have to know both to be able to answer that question properly. Thank you. You talked about skates, which is a great segue into the next set of questions. But there's one further honing question from Sarah. Um, she said, do you consider she dilation playing an important role for reactivation and honing? Uh, well, Yes, probably, potentially. Um, there are, again, two aspects that could play a role. So during the initial sort of acceleration of, of, of a rupture and you have dilatation, the first thing that will happen is that locally the pore pressure would decrease um, if the fluids cannot rush in to fill that dilatation. And that would cause... Uh, it would break the rupture to some extent because it actually increases the effective normal stress. But to be honest, we don't really know too much about that um, and how local that that is and how um, how much of a break that would be. The earthquakes still happen. So I, I think that there is definitely shear dilation happening, uh, but probably it's to such an extent or the, the rocks are so permeable that uh, the fluid pressure doesn't really change all that much. Okay. But Thank that's you. I guess. Thank you. Well, there's certainly more research than, than to be done. Um, so we have, as I said, quite a few questions around scale and um, there's sort of a series of questions from Mr. JVIJ. I have no idea who this is and this. Thanks for the great talk. What would be the most meaningful scale to model fault friction? Um, continues, given the complex dyn dynamic behavior of friction, the grain scale first need to be Brain scale model first need to be developed to feed the continuum model with the appropriate parameters to quantify the friction law. So if I want to keep myself in business, I'm going to say, yes, of course, it has to be on the grain scale. Um, but to be honest, I think uh, that we cannot ignore any scale. Um, and it also depends very much on the question that you try to answer. So if you talk about induced seismicity, I think the smaller scale heterogeneities are quite important. Um, and which must be linked to, to grain scale processes as well. Uh, if we're talking about natural earthquakes, then we can probably ignore the smaller scale heterogeneities. And then we have to look more at uh, distribution of, of things like seismological asperities, if you will, which is kind of what we try to do with our implementation of the, the, the microphysical model in the seismic cycle uh, simulator. So those are really addressing the, the big earthquakes. Um, so I, I, I don't think that there's uh, a sort of, to my, in my mind, there's, there's not a single answer to that question, to be honest. Sorry. Um, 
The other thing that uh, also links to the shear dilation, the coupling with fluid flow becomes important as well. Mm. Uh, and which might happen on a different scale than some of these fault strength variations. So there's yeah. a lot of uh, input needed for modeling. Uh, and, and I think we can really only make, make steps if we start to do more uh, lab-based uh, modeling and modeling-based uh, lab work. So there has to be more uh, interaction. Also, larger scale experiments uh, can be very insightful. You mentioned um, fluid flow there, and I'm just going to divert slightly from a second. Um, Iman Ramizade asked, thank you for the nice talk. Did you study the effect of pore pressure changes in fault friction behavior? Uh, yes. Um, so for the Groningen case, we have done experiments under dry conditions with uh, methane, with uh, brine. Uh, we have not looked at uh, specific effects of pore pressure itself. We've mostly tried to investigate the chemical effects of the fluids. Um, what we have done in terms of dry versus pressurized, it doesn't really seem to make much of a difference as long as we know the effect of normal stress. So the problem with, with lab scale experiments, uh, particularly for clay rich faults, um, is that you have to go very slow to make sure that the pressure that you apply on the outside is the same as the pressure on the inside. If it's not, then you don't really know the effect of normal stress anymore. So then your friction doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, so that's one of the effects. In, in uh, high velocity experiments, it's a very important, um, I didn't talk about those, but they're basically aimed at simulating a seismic event. So going at meters per second, when you already have the rupture. Um, and then it's very important what your initial pore pressure is. You start at atmospheric pressure, pressure you can get vaporization of, material, of the fluid. And that is uh, not happening when you start with some elevated pore pressure. So that has a big difference, uh, has a big effect. So. Thank you. Um, coming back to the modeling. So Peter Zhu asked, and thank you, Andre, for the nice presentation. The model you've presented seems to be a contact mechanics model. I was wondering for the embedded method, how this model can be well applied. I'm not sure I understand the question. Yes, yeah, so the, yeah, it's a contact mechanics, as in what we do is we have to define uh, a microstructure, which gives us the stresses and uh, so we can define the thermodynamic quantities um, in the framework of that um, microstructure. So we need to have a diffusion length scale over which our time dependent mechanism is operating. So that's why grain size is a very important parameter, uh, in fact. Um, so the key here is that we end up with uh, partial differential equations that can be solved. Um, so the only assumption that we're making then is that our um, equations are valid over your entire modeling domain. So in the example that I showed, the only thing that we varied was kinetics of pressure solution. I mean, you could also vary the grain size and you could get similar results. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of the power of it. You can, you can take uh, natural observations of uh, thickness of the localized shear band and grain size and just input that into the model. Um, and that is going to give you uh, a fault strength and a variation of fault strength, depending on temperature and pressure. Thank you. Not sure. Um, question, but okay. <laughs> maybe Peter can, can comment on this um, in the chat. Um, like a number of questions of related to the experiments and what other parameters can uh, might matter. So I'm going to pick a few of those and also try to keep my own time. So Edgar Hernandez wonders, is the thickness of the gout region important for fault fraction? Uh, well, I can talk very long about that, uh, or I can be here quite, quite short. So um, in, in the early days of friction experiments, uh, experiments were done on, on um, bare rock interfaces. Um, but typically, those showed that after a certain amount of displacement, the friction was changing, and that was because gouge was produced. Um, in the opposite direction, if we do our experiments with gouge, uh, we often 
almost always see that we develop a localized shear band along the interface uh, with our uh, pistons, uh, so-called Y shear. And that uh, shear band thickness doesn't seem to change all that much. If we change the thickness of our layer, we still get the same shear band thickness. So in that sense, it doesn't matter too much. The key thing is that our gouge layer has to be thick enough so that our pistons, uh, the roughness of our pistons is not interfering with each other. Uh, you can imagine if you have the teeth uh, grinding over each other, then our friction measurement doesn't really make a lot of sense anymore. So um, it doesn't matter too much. I think that's the yes. answer. Shear strain and, and things like that might, might be more important. Thank you. Staying so on what is happening in the fault plane, uh, Milad Nadero asks, and Andre says, Andre, great talk. In terms of fault plane and RSF behavior, how do you think about using gauge material between fault plane with roughness? How can roughness affect the RSF behavior? That's a great question. Uh, it's very difficult to uh, simulate. Uh, well, you can simulate roughness to some extent in the lab, but it's always very small scale. And I think in nature, uh, you have roughness on a much larger scale. And of course, what it will do is that um, and there's two things that it will do. First, it will change the stresses on the fault. So in that, in that sense, it's quite important. Um, and the second thing is it will maybe change uh, how much wear and how much grain size reduction you have. So the reason that we have a roughened interface is because we want to make sure that not all the slip is occurring on the interface. Um, but what you typically see is that, in, in some experiments anyway, you produce enough fine grain material to produce this boundary shear. And that is then covering up your artificial roughness anyway. And that's when you get to, to the state where you are nucleating these, these laboratory earthquakes. Um, it doesn't happen in all materials. So my short, question, short, short answer would be, uh, yes, it will affect it. Um, but over long enough displacement, it would even out. Thank you. We'll pick uh, plenty of more questions, and in the, in the sake of time, I'm going to pick one more question again from Sarah. Just thank you for the talk. Are the values obtained in the lab tests applicable to faults modeled in the field scale? It seems to be. Seems to be. <laughs> uh, yes. So of course, the, the question, uh, the question, the big question is: Is what we are simulating in a lab? Uh, representative for what happens in faults. I think to some extent it is. Uh, other things like fault scale roughness on a larger scale, we cannot really simulate. Um, but we have done experiments on a larger scale, so like meter scale, and those parameters are exactly the same as what we do on a five centimeter scale. So in that sense, the size doesn't really seem to matter. Well, thank you very much, Andre, for taking the time to answer all these questions so diligently. Um, thank you to our audience for some really great and insightful questions. And again, thank you for the excellent talk and the great overview, as Anke just um, mentions here. So with that, Hadi, over to you again. Yes, thank you very much, uh, everyone. I'd like to quickly take the chance and introduce our next week as speaker. Uh, next week, the same time, uh, we are going to uh, host Andreas Bush, Professor Andreas Bush from Heliot Watt University. Andreas will uh, speak about leakage from subsurface storage reservoirs. How much should we care? So from rock mechanics, we switch gears to fluid mechanics in the reservoir. So stay happy, healthy, and tuned into our channel for next week, another geoscientific and geoenergetic talk. Andre, thanks a lot, Andre. It was a great yeah. talk and a lot of questions already. So thanks very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Andre. Bye-bye. See you.